let's uh, move to uh, a short bible study today uh, and before that praveen can just ask for god's blessings and his presence with us as we discuss let's pray father we come to thy presence with attitude of gratitude lord for provision your protection especially your lord and uh, by because of your grace alone we could be safe and we could uh, join through this kind of uh, medium lord to have fellowship with our brethren to pray for the uh, sick and weak and people who are in need o lord need o lord and, uh, lord we are going to spend some time in the meditation of your word i pray that your grace may be granted to us and by your spirit you enable us to perceive what you are want to uh, what you want us to receive oh lord and speak through your servant and whatever we discuss here lord may bring glory to your name and uh, the words may be encouraging to one another oh lord your name be exalted through everything that we do in jesus name we pray amen 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 well today uh, what i wanted to do was to discuss this scripture which uh, i had just basically uh, alluded to last time before we close uh, and that is in 2 samuel chapter 12 and if those of you who might not know we are be de- dealing with the subject of marriage some of the basic uh, teachings of the scriptures uh, with regards to the marital union and so uh, along uh, you know uh, along with that of course some uh this was one of the questions that has come up and this is a fairly difficult troubling scripture and after i uh, discuss this i will just complete with three more uh questions reading from our booklet so the scripture that is um uh, not an easy one to tackle is second samuel chapter 12 and verse 8 uh if i can before i read it uh the context i think you all know is david having committed adultery and then of course murder he is confronted by the prophet nathan and nathan says to him you know uh, how could you do this uh especially when you have been blessed so much that you surreptitiously go commit adultery and then you have the audacity to kill the the, the lady's uh, husband and so god is outraged and nathan then confronts him and uh, in the course of the conversation verse 8 comes out as one of those uh, difficult scriptures let me read you verse 8 it says and here is god talking through nathan nathan as he uh, you know reprimands david he says i gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms i gave you all israel and juda and if all this has been had been too little i would have given you even more so uh this is the problem here is he you know mentions the master's wives and then he mentions more and so this scripture is used by some to to justify polygamy that god is actually promoting polygamy that he would be willing to give you know he would have been willing to give more wives to uh, david right um now if it means that god wants to give more wives to david if that is how we conclude as some have then we have a major problem because it directly contradicts all that we know from scripture and of course especially deuteronomy chapter 17 it directly contradicts that now deuteronomy 17 if i can bring the context the context of course you have to go back to you know to Deuteronomy chapter 10 uh where god gives these commands these are the commands that god gives israel and he tells israel and their leaders that this is how you must walk notice in Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 2 it says and now o israel 
What does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And dropping down to verse 13, it says, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. Now, so these are, uh, what does these commands include? There we come down to Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 17, it says, and talking especially to the leadership, he says, he must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. And then it concludes by saying he must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Now, God himself is saying that he must not take many wives. How can we conclude that God himself is offering more wives? I mean, doesn't it seem so silly, so imbecilic? What kind of a God we have? I mean, uh, you know, he, he, he is an, I mean, if God, if we conclude that God is offering more wives, he's an absolute liar. Can we worship a God who is an absolute liar, who says on one, on one occasion that you must not take many wives. On the other, he says, I give you more wives. So obviously there is a problem there, right? Uh, very clearly, it goes against all that we have understood uh, about God and his intentions for marriage. And in the, I think, in uh, two or three weeks back, we discussed the various basics that the Bible teaches about marriage. It is between one male and one female. So we concluded that the scripture does not allow and does not teach polygamy or polyandry, all right? Many husbands, one wife. So the Bible then, if it is true that God is giving more wives to David, then obviously it contradicts the scriptures. It contradicts God himself. Like I said, we have a God that, you know, we just can't trust because he flip-flops. And obviously, uh, we'll have to throw the Bible out completely. So, uh, what can we understand from the scripture? Second Samuel chapter 12 and verse 8, <clears throat> verse 8, which I just read, is obviously difficult. And I can tell you <laughs> that we won't be able to resolve it uh, entirely. Because the unfortunate thing is there isn't enough clarification there. There isn't enough information from which we can bring a very clear, you know, explanation of it. So I'm afraid we will not be able to resolve that particular scripture in its entirety. But I can give you the following thoughts. And uh, just a few thoughts for us to resolve this as much as it is possible. Now notice the verse says, I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. Now, once again, there is a debate as to what could that mean. The original Hebrew, when it talks about arms, could also mean bosom. Or it could also mean care. I'm giving these people into your care. Or into your keeping. Now the question is, is God giving these, you know, the, the master's wives, and obviously it's a reference to Saul. Saul was the king earlier. Does God give uh, all of these wives of Saul to David for sexual activity? What could this arms mean or bosom or, or care or into your keeping? Does it mean sexual activity? That is the first thought that we have. Oh, they, that they become or join the harem of David. Now, if that, is, if that is true, such an interpretation would suggest that God only views women as useful for sex. But that is wrong. That is not correct from what we read with regards to the first woman created. God didn't create Eve just for sex, <laughs> right? So obviously 
that is reading too much into the scripture and i feel that is erroneous now some may conclude that david married saul's wives but this isn't a necessary conclusion because there is no mention that david actually married those ladies because david had his own wives so what does it mean when it says i gave your masters uh master's house to you and your master's wives notice the description your master's house and your master's wives there is a study done and the study concludes the following the the phraseology used there to give the master's house or the master's wives into your care uh basically means that david has become the king all right it's symbolic when the master's house is given to you it's symbolic that david had ascended on the throne he is taken over the master's role as king so that is one explanation that is offered so it is metaphorical in the sense that david has now ascended the throne there is another explanation when it says i have given the master's wives into your uh, into your arms it could also mean bosom bosom is more of an endearing word which could also mean care into your uh, protection into your your uh, what provision in other words these ladies would have become widows and they would have no means of support they would have no what you say uh, protection from you know those who want to unscrupulously use them or they would have no means of supporting themselves and so this phraseology could also mean that god expects david to take care of them not specifically for sexual favors but to provide for them so this is the explanation that is offered uh right so um the scripture also says i have given your master's house to you and your master's wives into your bosom i gave you all israel and juda and then it says and if all this had been too little i would have given you more the problem with this particular phrase is we always uh you know like to conclude or assume more means wives <laughs> and that i think is the problem we automatically think oh god is saying more wives you know and of course the polygamist uh, are rejoicing because they think oh god is saying you know take more wives as many as you want but this is an assumption i feel and once again the scholars who have studied this also conclude that what basically god is saying is that if wealth power authority had been too little if all the resources he had had been too little god is in the you know has the power to give him more more authority more kingdoms if he wanted to so god's point is that david had it all david had so much so taking another man's wife you know and committing adultery and then killing her husband is all the more despicable is all the more unpardonable i mean unpardonable in the sense that you know it is just a horrific crime so that is what is the point being stressed here and unfortunately we forget what is being stressed and we look into the detail and say oh wives you know more wives and that i think is the wrong reading so the context is basically david being reprimanded not that god wanting to give more wives and then proving the point that uh you know polygamy is okay 
right? So that I think is what we can conclude from the study we have uh, been able to make. So you cannot take the scripture to prove God endorses polygamy, right? There is too much of ambiguity there. Uh, uh, you know, God is basically reprimanding David. He is basically saying, telling David that, you know, uh, how come you lust after so much? I mean, when you have already so much, that is the main point. And if it, the wives are mentioned, household is mentioned, it is probably a, a reference to David being now the king, right? David ascending the throne. He's been given the position that his master had. And that probably is, uh, you know, what we can conclude. Uh, I'll stop there. Um, before I read, uh, you know, some uh, some of those questions, any any thoughts on what we just discussed? While it is fresh in our minds, maybe you have something to con to contribute. Any comments you'd like to make? Or perhaps if if you feel the uh, do you feel that the explanation given is uh, plausible or uh, uh, satisfactory. <laughs> Any thoughts? Yes, Franklin, go ahead. Sir, so very balanced approach. You have taken a balanced and objective approach. Okay. All right. Thank you, Franklin. I think, uh, yeah, that is how the some of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, theologians conclude. So uh, I feel, yes. Uh, it's unfortunate that we run off into this, uh, you know, this controversy, uh, you know, unnecessarily. Yes, uh, Bertram, go ahead. Uh, can you unmute yourself, Bertie? We cannot hear you. Also, in the New Testament script, scriptures, uh, there's uh, there's no mention of uh, uh, any polygamy or polyandry as such. God, it always says the credentials of an elder should be, you know, one wife. And uh, also God said in the beginning he created, uh, you know, uh, marriage and that God hates divorce. And um, it's always uh, uh, marriage involves one, one man, one woman. Yeah. And uh, uh, God, that, that, is the, uh, that is what God says because it, it, it's the same relationship it pictures the relationship up with marriage, the human marriage uh, pictures the relationship between Christ and his church. Thank you, Bertie. Yes, not I only, think, yeah. not only, uh, not marrying one wife, but also faithfulness. Right. Faithfulness too. Yes, thank you. I think uh, uh, very clearly the Bible is consistent in terms of its position with regards to this whole, uh, you know, controversy about polygamy and some of the other controversies. Uh, so we leave it there for the moment. And uh, if we can go to the booklet, maybe Praveen can bring up that uh, graphic on the, on the screen. We will go to question 19. And uh, this is of course what uh, triggered this whole study in marriage. So let's read what the booklet actually says. And the question that is asked, if you notice on your screen is, what is the Christian view of marriage? And this is what it says. As revealed in the Holy Scriptures and as stated by Jesus, God established marriage as an exclusive sacred union between one man, one woman. That union is a unique living witness that reflects and honors God's covenant relationship with his people in Jesus Christ. It is a union that involves a unity, a difference, and a harmonious uh, coordination of being and action in holy loving. That unity, which normally has the potential to be fruitful by generating newborn life, bears witness to the life-giving nature of the triune God uh, through the union and communion of the Father and Son in the Spirit. Christian marriage, uh, lived as a witness to God's faithfulness, honors God and builds trust between human beings 
especially between men and women. If you notice, most of what we have just read, uh, you know, aligns with what we have discussed so far. And uh, this is our uh, church's position, the official GCI position with regards to marriage and how we would regard marriage to be. I just want to pick up one or two thoughts from there uh, in the third, uh, uh, you know, sent a third line there. It says, it is a union that involves a unity. Uh, I, I, I like that particular, uh, the, the way it is put. It's a union that involves a unity. You know, we have been talking so much about relationship and, you know, our God, uh, you know, is a relational God and he has invested the whole relational dimension in us. Uh, but this relationship should always go with this unit union. You see, in other words, our our standing with God, our, what you say, um, the way we regard God is not just in a relationship, but it's also a relationship that leads into a union. So in other words, it's more than a relationship, right? And that is what we have understood from the Trinitarian worldview, right? Um, the, the, uh, just as a marital you know, I mean, the marital union does not stop at a relationship. A relationship is a connection. It's an association. But a union is the result of that relationship, right? A union is an action of joining to result in oneness. You know, that oneness comes in the union. And the relationship makes that possible. So you have this interplay between relationship and union which is so powerfully reflected in the Trinitarian reality, isn't it? Uh, uh, God is a union, uh, one being, and yet he is three persons. There is a distinction and there is a union. And that is what marriage is. And it also, uh, in the answer which we just read, it also talks about how this union is life-giving. You know, when husband and wife come together, especially now in the sexual union, it is life-giving, right? Just as the union in, in, within, the tri, in, within the triune God, the Father in the, you know, uh, in the Son, and the Son in the Father, and of course in the Holy Spirit is also life-giving. So you see that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, reflection. Uh, it's a powerful reflection. And so... Um, that is what we have been, uh, you know, we have you know, discussed even last time, how that mystery, that is the mystery of the marital union, which reflects the, uh, the Trinitarian reality. Let's go to question number 20 now and uh, very quickly read 20 and 21. Uh, just to, you know, once again, uh, complete this whole thought with regards to uh, the, the ma marriage and, mar and marital relationship. Question 20 talks about adultery. And I thought there should be, uh, th there is an interesting point here, which I'd like to bring out. Uh, the question reads, why should Christians not commit adultery? And the answer reads like this. We should not commit adultery because it is contrary to the bond of marriage created by God. That bond is deeply damaged if not irreparably broken by the sin of adultery. But more damaging, such unfaithfulness bears false witness to a God who is absolutely faithful to his people. It thereby harms our souls, undermines our faith, hinders our hope in God, and diminishes our love for God and for others. It sows the seeds of unbelief in our hearts and minds and sets up barriers for trusting in God's faithfulness, who will never betray us, who will never betray us. Adultery dishonors God and destroys trust between human beings. So uh, that is a, you know, a much more expanded view of trying to understand this, this uh, thing about adultery. Um, it's interesting the answer points out that 
uh, just than losing a relationship between a man and a woman uh, when adultery is committed. Notice it goes to the extent of saying it also bears false witness to a God who is absolutely faithful. Why does it say that? And in my understanding, it says it because God uses the marital union, the earthly marital union, as a reflection of his own faithfulness. So when we who believe in a God who is faithful to us and go and live unfaithfully, uh, that is bearing false witness to a God who's absolutely faithful. And that, I think, is a very profound thought that we need to uh, bear in mind. Notice the spiritual and the physical connection or the spiritual connection with the physical act of adultery. I think we need to bear in mind. And of course, it also goes on to say it sows the seeds of unbelief in our hearts and minds and sets up barriers uh, to trusting in God's faithfulness. In other words, this breach in the, you know, in the relational uh, purity between man and wife corrupts our minds. It, uh, it, uh, once that, you know, once our minds are corrupted, it projects a sense of unfaithfulness to God himself. It diminishes our trust in God because that sense of unfaithfulness in our minds can be projected onto God himself. And that is where it damages our relationship even with God. Not only our spouse, but even with God. So there is a spiritual, what you say, consequence to these kinds of activities which are sinful. Uh, so the physical and the spiritual relationships are affected. All right. So those are some thoughts that I'd like to offer. Let's just finish with uh, question 21 then. Just have a few more minutes. And uh, Question 21 also uh, remains on the subject. The question reads, why should Christians avoid sexual immorality of all kinds? I'll read it and I'll just pick up one point from there. The, uh, question, the answer is, since love is God's great gift, God expects us to not corrupt, corrupt it or confuse it with momentary desire to fulfill our own selfish pleasures. God forbids all sexual immorality, whether in married life, adultery, or single life fornication. Faithfulness is essential to experience the blessings of marriage. The faithfulness of celibacy, is essential to experience the blessings of being unmarried. All sexual relations outside the safe boundaries of covenant marriage are forms of sexual abuse and harm our capacity to form healthy relationships of non-sexual love between members of the body of Christ and sexual relationships of married couples. Sexual relations are safe and healthy and honor God only when experienced within a lifelong commitment to marriage between one man and one woman. All else far, falls far short of the glory of God and his good purposes for humanity. All sexual immorality, including sexual abuse and fornication, dishonors God and destroys trust between human beings. Uh, the point I want to pick up from there is the fact that notice um, when we indulge in sexual immorality, it's saying that it is uh, it falls far short of the good purposes that God has for humanity. See, some people tend to think, oh, you know, God is a you know spoiled sport. Why can't He just let us have some fun? Let us just enjoy you know, the sexual, you know, uh, profligacy with, you know, as many as we can, as though God is against us enjoying ourselves. And that is the fallacy or the fallacial thinking that we might have when we think about God prohibiting sexual immorality. God is not against enjoyment. God is not against us enjoying life to the full. But the reason he is against immorality is because it, uh, it 
destroys enjoyment. It is against enjoyment. It takes away the kind of pleasure we can actually enjoy by being faithful, right? So it is prohibited not to stop us being, you know, enjoying life, but it stops us from destroying ourselves, destroying the relational, you know, uh, harmony and of course the blessing of relationships. And that's the reason why God says no, because this is not, you're not gonna enjoy this. This is only gonna lead to party. All right, I think I'll stop there. Uh, we, we went through a mouthful of uh, things. Any thoughts, comments, uh, or questions that you might have? We're going to, uh, at this, for, with this, we are going to stop the subject of uh, marriage. We'll pick up a new subject uh, next time. So the floor is open. Any comments, questions, uh, anything that you'd like to add, any reflections you have on those scriptures? All right. Okay. Either you're hungry or uh, <laughs> ready to want to go for dinner or uh, you are absolutely okay with uh, what are our discussions. I hope you are comfortable with this. These are the official GCI positions with regards to how we think about these matters. Of course, uh, there are issues, there are many more issues with regards to this whole uh, subject of marriage, of sexuality. There is, I think uh, Franklin brought up this whole concept of, you know, the whole issue of uh, homosexuality. And that's, that's, a, that's a huge subject. And of course, uh, we do have an official position on that. Maybe we'll take it up another time. Praveen, any thoughts, anything you'd like to add? All right. Well, I hope uh, you have uh, at least benefited somewhat from our discussions. And uh, uh, let's, uh, I, 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 need to, I need to see whether we can finish one or two more uh, aspects from the booklet uh, next time. And then we'll take up some specialized subjects from the scriptures once we finish this book. Uh, there are several things that I'm, I'm sure Praveen would like to bring out uh, as we go along. I'm hoping that some of our uh, team leaders will also take a session or two. So yes, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but this whole uh, COVID issue has kind of, uh, you know, disrupted a few things and uh, but anyway, we will get to it uh, finally. I think uh, on that note, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, once again, please be safe. I do want you to remember that this new variant, which has now been, I think the, uh, I'm not sure if it is Dr. Fauci or if it is WHO that has said that this new variant in India is actually a, a global concern because of this now, uh, begins to start traveling all over the world, uh, you know, even the vaccines can't be of much help, I'm presuming, I don't know. But, uh, but let's just uh, keep uh, that in mind. Double masks, please. And if, you, if, you, if, it is, if it is possible, please throw away those uh, cloth masks. They really don't help. Uh, use those proper surgical or N95s, please, uh, you know, don't, especially when you're going into enclosed areas. All right, that's my medical advice for you today. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bertie, can I request you to close in prayer, please? Bertie, can you hear me? Yes, let's pray. Uh, Father God, we just want to thank you for bringing us together uh, during this Bible study time where we were Lord. Where we were taught. Uh, where we were taught uh, um, in the light of the scriptures. And uh, Lord, we have uh, we continue to bless you and praise you for the good things that you teach us, Lord, and, and consolidating us and strengthening us uh, in the way of our God, which is good, right, pleasing in your sight, and which is good for each of us. We just want to thank you so much, Lord, that you're using your servant 
Mr. Zakari, not to cover the subjects like we are covering at the present time, the subject of marriage, Lord, the relationship, the union, Lord, and the communion, and Lord, how it reflects the, the triune God's relationship and union and communion. Lord, we just want to thank you and bless you that, that we continue to grow in your ways, Lord, and that you continue to use the servant to teach us, Lord, covering different subjects in the light of the scriptures. We thank you for, Lord, giving us an opportunity to pray for our fellow brothers and sisters uh, regarding their, uh, this COVID-19, uh, Lord, epidemic, where they have been, Lord, afflicted, where they've been struggling and, Lord, have been sick. We pray that you will uh, rebuke it and deliver them, Lord, all that the names that we mentioned. Please, Lord, have mercy on them and take this COVID, Lord, sickness from them, Lord, and restore them to good health. Also, we pray for our nation, Lord, that you help them, the leaders, to manage the situation, Lord, and that the shortages that we hear about and deaths due to the shortages may be rectified. And that you, Lord, may rebuke this COVID-19 once and for all. Lord, we are a good God, and you will do what we, uh, which is right in your sight, Lord. You know our needs even before we ask you, Lord. Our need is to help us, Lord and to take the necessary precaution, for you are with us, Lord. You are our help and strength, our help and our shield. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. We pray this prayer, Father, in the blessed and glorious name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.